Welcome to Brain Mini Lecture number six. Last time we met, we were talking about the three types of white matter fibers. They were association, commissural, and projection. Now, if we look at this frontal section of a brain, we are going to be able to see all three. For example, if I look right here, this white matter right here is not leaving this right hemisphere. So that is an example of an association fiber. Now this guy right there, that bit of white matter is connecting the right and the left hemispheres to one another. So that is a commissural fiber. And finally, last but not least, we see this guy here as well as this guy here. These guys, you can tell the direction that they're going. In fact, if we, if I erase one of them, I'm gonna put an arrow on this one, and we can see how it's going down, 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 down. That means it's a projection fiber. All right. Let's take another look at some fiber, white matter fibers here. These are some really cool white matter fibers. It's almost like we can see the bundles of axons here. And what we're looking at is actually the corpus callosum. We're actually looking at the corpus callosum, which I know that you met in the lab on the brain. And the corpus callosum is this set of commissural fibers that are going to connect the left and right cerebral hemispheres. All right, with that, we are done the white matter fibers. So we're pretty much done with the cerebrum. I think we're totally done with the cerebrum. And yeah, we are. Now we get to go on and do the diencephalon. The diencephalon is hard to see, not hard, it's impossible to see from the lateral view from the outside because the cerebrum is so big, it mushrooms over it as it grows. And right at the core of the cerebrum, we're going to have the diencephalon. It is basically a gray matter trio, three gray matter structures. The thalamus, and the word thalamus means secret room, which makes sense because of how hidden the cerebrum is, plus the hypothalamus, which, as its name implies, is going to be under the thalamus, and the epithalamus, which should be above the thalamus, according to the epi part of its name. We'll see if it lives up to that. All right, if we look at a slice of the brain, we can see all three regions. The region that is the darker purple, darker purple, there's my arrow right there, that is the thalamus, that whole purple egg right there. And notice the two halves of the thalamus are connected by this little chunk here called the interthalamic adhesion. Now this area underneath the thalamus is the hypothalamus. And then over on the other side, right there, there it is, that's actually the biggest part of the epithalamus, that's the pineal gland. Now, hmm, it doesn't exactly look, you know, epi, like above the thalamus, but that's because we're bipeds. If we were quadrupeds, then the name would work out great. So, these are the three regions of the diencephalon. Let's talk about each one of them in turn. First up, the thalamus. Looks kind of like a pair of eggs right here in this guy's skull. It's the biggest part, so 80%, four-fifths of the diencephalon. It is a relay station. So, you gotta realize, there's just a crazy amount of sensory signals going into your brain. Signals of touch, body position, temperature, visual signals, gustatorial factory, auditory, and you need to ignore most of them. The thalamus lets you do that. It lets you, it lets you edit these signals, it lets you decide, it basically decides which ones should come to the forefront of your consciousness. That is its number one big primary job, sensory relay station, sensory filtering. It also plays a role in movement. It talks to the basal nuclei, which we talked about earlier. It talks about the, to the it talks to the cerebellum, who we're going to discuss 
in a later lecture. And it does interact with the cerebrum and play a role in thinking as well. Okay, if I look here, I see all these senses and they're all basically routing to the thalamus. There's the thalamus in yellow right there. And somatic senses from the body. So we're talking touch, pressure, pain, temperature, proprioception. Gustatory signals from the tongue to the thalamus as well. Signals from your inner ear about your state of equilibrium, your state of balance to the thalamus. Sound, auditory signals from your ear to the thalamus. Visual signals from the eyeball to the thalamus. The only sense that actually doesn't go to the thalamus is smelling. Smelling goes right to the olfactory cortex. There is no relay station or filtration station for your sense of smell. All right, hypothalamus time. Hypothalamus is underneath the thalamus. In this picture, the thalamus is up here. This is the hypothalamus right here. Here's the pituitary gland, infundibulum, and these are all different chunks of hypothalamus. I don't want you to learn the names of all these different locations, but I want you to notice some of the jobs that are listed. Water balance, body temp, blood pressure, water balance, stress, shivering, GI tract control, satiety, feeding. Basically, the hypothalamus plays a big role in controlling many of your, hype, of your uh, homeostatic functions. It is also going to make hormones and the hormones from the hypothalamus actually are shuttled down to the back of the pituitary, to the posterior pituitary, where they're released. All right. Speaking of the pituitary gland, it is attached to the hypothalamus. So here's the pituitary down here. Here's the hypothalamus up here. This is the infundibulum, the stalk between them. I don't know if I've written that down yet recently. Let's write it down again just to make sure I know that you know what it is in fundibulum. There we go. All right. Notice that the pituitary gland has an anterior part and a posterior part. The anterior part is going to make its own hormones and release them, including follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, prolactin, growth hormone, and others. The posterior portion actually gets hormones that are made in the hypothalamus, and they travel down axons, which is just crazy, to the posterior pituitary, and then the posterior pituitary stores them and releases them. Two hormones get that treatment. Those are antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. All right, let's talk about these, these variety of hormones for just a minute. Let's do that. Let's get out of drawing mode here so I can advance. There we go. All right. This is an ovary. In the ovary, follicles are growing almost all the time, and follicles release an egg cell during ovulation. Now, we just mentioned a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone. It makes these ovarian follicles grow. And then the act of ovulation is actually caused by this hormone right here that we just mentioned, luteinizing hormone. Now, these hormones are also involved in testosterone production and sperm synthesis in gentlemen. Well, what about prolactin, literally for milk? Prolactin prompts the mammary glands to produce milk. Think about a nursing mom. Her prolactin levels are going to be up, letting her make milk for the baby. What else we got? Um, we got growth hormone, but we did growth hormone already. Antidiuretic hormone, that is a hormone that stops you from peeing. Antidiuretic means stops peeing. And what that does is it increases your blood volume and blood pressure. It also squeezes your blood vessels, which help, helps increase your blood pressure too. Okay, with that, we are done right here with these hormones.